Oh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you all this afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, you know, this is such a timely topic, of course, in so many ways, not only the Harvard Magazine article, but also the fact that we are really at this transformative moment in American education as over 50 million US students are not in school due to COVID-19 and they're engaging in various degrees of school at home distance learning. Uh, and in some ways, even though we have such limited freedom right now uh, as families and are all confined in our homes, it's interesting because many parents are becoming re-empowered, really reconnecting with their children and getting a better glimpse of their child's education uh, and potentially even experiencing maximum educational freedom. Some states, for instance, have shelved compulsory attendance mandates, curriculum directives. Uh, some districts are starting to end their school year early, uh, sort of ending their foray into distance learning for now with hopes that things improve te technologically for fall. Or they're explaining that any schoolwork being offered this spring is optional and for enrichment purposes only, particularly if they can't guarantee uh, full, uh, full equitable access to all students because of, again, connectivity issues or technology issues. Uh, and it's a real opportunity for families to disconnect from school and to really re-engage with their children and, and think about education as separate and distinct from schooling that I think Commissioner Edelblus so rightly pointed out that you know educate schooling is one method of being educated but it's certainly not the only one and I would argue perhaps not the preferred one the realities of the innovation era when human uh, creativity is really the thing we have to be focused on that is the, our key advantage as we increasingly coexist uh, in a world of artificial intelligence. It's interesting if we look at some of the data, even though, of course, again, 50 million US students home now with their families, um, isolated from their communities, uh, Ed Choice recently put out a survey where they asked families about various uh, experiences during the pandemic. And they found that more than half of their survey respondents actually have a more favorable view of homeschooling uh, as a result of the pandemic than they did before. Uh, and so I would say, you know, gee, if you're satisfied with homeschooling now, uh, confined in our homes and isolated from our communities, just wait till you see the real thing when you can truly be uh, immersed in the people, places and things around you. But I think that that's a good sign that more families would be interested in homeschooling uh, or alternatives to school and other education options post pandemic. Another more informal survey conducted by Corey DeAngelis, who's the director of school choice at the Reason Foundation, recently found that 15% uh, of his survey respondents, he had over a thousand respondents, indicated that they would be choosing homeschooling uh, come fall. And again, uh, even if that isn't, even if it's not the full 15%, it shows that there will be an uptick, I think, in homeschooling, uh, even if it's just temporary, if even if it's just temporary, the Wall Street Journal, for example, reported that Denmark uh, was the first country, European country, to reopen schools amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, and thousands of parents in Denmark chose to keep their children at home. Uh, so even if it's just temporary homeschooling, I think it's an opportunity for parents. Uh, to again be put back in the driver's seat of their of their children's education. We see similar historical evidence that parents are unlikely to send or all parents are unlikely to send their children back to school. Um, coming out of the 1916 polio epidemic in New York City, where about a quarter of the students stayed home in New York City when schools were reopened, which actually led to a temporary loosening of compulsory attendance laws. And so I think we'll see a lot of this happening uh, this fall or, or uh, whenever schools open here. Um, but it is an opportunity and a real springboard, I think, for families to consider homeschooling, particularly as remote working gains popularity. Uh, the Brookings Institution, for example, put out a recent report predicting a permanent shift toward teleworking for many employees, uh, even again after the pandemic ends. And I think that more families will see that they'll wanna give that same freedom and flexibility that they have in their work 
to their children for education. And it may also open up doors of opportunity for more flexible education options that if parents are working from home, they may not feel uh, the urgency to send their children away to a, a standard school all week. Um, and then as parents really begin to explore these different education options, again, back in charge of their children's education, I think that they will be intrigued by discovering what 21st century homeschooling really looks like. Uh, and it's nothing like that caricature presented in the one-sided Harvard Magazine article recently, um, and of course, in the much more in-depth Arizona Law Review article by Professor Elizabeth Bartholet. Today's nearly 2 million homeschoolers are increasingly reflective of the overall US population demographically, geographically, socioeconomically, ideologically. Uh, we see a lot of growth in minority homeschooling population. The percentage of black homeschoolers doubled between 2007 and to 2012 to about 8% uh, of the overall homeschool population. And the population of Hispanic homeschoolers is about 25% of the overall US homeschool population, which mirrors uh, the Hispanic population and the overall K to 12 uh, school age population. Uh, urban secular homeschoolers like mine, uh, urban secular homeschooling families like mine, I live just down the road from Harvard's main campus here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, are one of the fastest growing segments of the overall homeschooling population in the US. Uh, many of these uh, urban homeschoolers are disillusioned by one size fits all schooling models, size testing, uh, and really are looking for other options, much more individualized learning and personalized learning than they could find in a conventional classroom. Uh, and so I think, again, we're seeing a lot more growth in, in terms of um, the overall diversity of the modern homeschool population. In the Harvard Magazine article, and twice in Bartholet's Arizona, Arizona Law Review article, she says that up to 90% of today's homeschoolers are driven by conservative Christian beliefs. And I have sort of two responses to that. One would be to say first, you know, so what? If that were true, why would that be an indicator of a need to heavily regulate the practice or potential? Um, regardless of the, the distribution of who is, you know, who's participating in homeschooling. But beyond that, better data suggests that about two thirds of the US homeschool population identifies as Christian, which is rep reflective of the overall US population as a whole. According to the Pew Research Center, about two thirds of the US population identifies as Christian. So again, homeschooling would be reflective of the overall American population. Um, but religion is not the top motivator for today's homeschooling families. In fact, the most recent data out of the US Department of Education uh, finds that only 16% of respondents in this national, uh, national survey said that religion was the most uh, important factor in their decision to, to homeschool. In fact, the number one motivator for today's homeschooling families in the US is concern about the environment of uh, other schools including safety, drugs, and negative peer pressure. Uh, so, you know, we may have religious homeschoolers, and we have certainly, again, a diverse group of homeschoolers today, but religion is not what is driving most homeschoolers. It may be driving some, but not the majority. Again, it's that concern about what's happening in other schools and really wanting different educational options. Uh, we can talk a little bit about outcomes of today's homeschooling families uh, or to today's homeschoolers, most peer reviewed studies, for example, find that uh, homeschoolers uh, excel academically in some cases uh, better than their school peers and have positive um, life outcomes. A study by Peter Gray, Boston College psychology professor who studies unschoolers or those who engage in more self-directed education tied to homeschooling. He also wrote the foreword to my unschooled book. He finds that uh, similar results that grown unschoolers grow up to uh, succeed in whatever path they choose. They do well in college if they choose to go there, uh, have no trouble academically. And in fact, I think one of the more interesting findings of his study is that more than half of the adults in his grown unschooling study uh, were working as entrepreneurs 
in careers tied to interests that developed in childhood and adolescence. Again, the sort of freedom to learn in childhood and adolescence that's so critical. Um, you know, one of the, I think, more egregious claims that Bartholet makes in, uh, again, both the Harvard Magazine article and the Arizona Law Review article uh, are that this idea that homeschooled children are kept at home and isolated from the larger community. Um, but that is, is just so untrue. You know, if you think about not only the research that's come out recently, but even research dating back um, 10 or 15 years ago, most of the, the good peer reviewed research on homeschooling finds that homeschoolers are quite well connected to their communities, quite well socialized. In fact, Daniel Hamlin out of the University of Oklahoma published an article in the past year that found that homeschoolers have high levels of what he calls cultural capital, really immersed in their communities, going to the library, going to museums, going to cultural events, sporting events, mu music events, and so on, in some cases at higher rates than their school peers, because of course they have that much more flexibility in their daily schedules. Uh, you know, I'll just give a little bit of, of background before I wrap up on, on how I became interested in homeschooling. This was back in the late 1990s, uh, when I was an undergraduate in college, I was an economics major, but became really interested in education in particular, looking at the choices that in education and, and the choices that they couldn't make because of uh, system of family who lived nearby. And um, again, this 90s homeschooling had just become legally recognized in all 50 states a few years prior by the mid 1990s. Uh, so it was a relatively new phenomenon. And I just remember being completely enchanted by this homeschooling family and the real authentic socialization that I saw in their family, engaged in their community, uh, authentic learning tied to the child's interests. And it was really in stark contrast to that same semester when I was doing a, a student teaching practicum in a local public elementary school and saw uh, how much more confined and controlled the school children were compared to uh, the homeschool child. And that really, that image really stuck with me. It's what ultimately prompted me to go to graduate school in education policy at Harvard, where I became more interested in educational choice and freedom, as well as alternative education. But it wasn't until about a decade later when I was uh, a mom looking at education options for my own children that I discovered, you know, the real joy of homeschooling and realized that, you know, if I sent my children to school, their learning would contract. They would go to the same building every day with the same age segregated group of peers, the same static handful of teachers doing the same standardized curriculum. And instead, I really wanted my children to be fully and authentically immersed in our community, taking classes through local libraries, museums, nature centers, interacting with mentors and tutors and peers. Uh, so to me, you know, sending them to school would be more isolating uh, than, than being immersed in their community. And I think that's where I was particularly um, surprised by Bartholet's portrayal of homeschoolers uh, as being isolated when, the, when the, real, the opposite is really true. So I'll, I'll just begin to close up by saying that, you know, I think as more parents warm up to homeschooling uh, during this uh, COVID homeschooling experience, uh, as they disconnect from their local school district, they may be re-empowered and decide to choose homeschooling. I think that they will also see that there's all kinds of ways to homeschool now, that hybrid homeschooling models in particular are getting increasingly popular where you're able to uh, have your child at home part of the time and then in the community or in various learning centers or schools for part of the time that opens up this option to more families, particularly to two working families or single parent families. I think it's a great time for education entrepreneurship, particularly in the homeschool space uh, that will also help to expand new options to more families. Um, you know, the pandemic has led to massive disruption in how we live and learn. Uh, and I think this will be a defining moment, not only for homeschooling as more parents choose this option, but for educational freedom more broadly. Thank you.